Welcome to Pros from the Underground, coming to you from my basement in northern Michigan, where I read, write, think, and say things, and sometimes, like tonight, I get to talk to someone. It's my second interview. This time I'm talking with Chad Broffman, a writer I met a few years back at Interlochen Arts Academy. We were at a writing conference together, and I thought instantly, wow, this guy can write. As evidence of that, he has many stories published. He's won two chapbook contests, most recently won from the Etchings Press at the University of Indianapolis. Tonight, I ask him to start this interview by reading a bit. He's gonna read a micro piece, and I think you'll enjoy. From there, he's gonna offer a few really compelling ideas about the writing process. Well, thanks, John, and thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And um, I'm in my camper, so there's some rain falling that's hopefully adding to some ambiance here. But uh, I'm going to read a micro fiction piece called uh, Unfolded from the chat book slide. Yes, sir. I scoot my chair forward, not closer, just forward, and the wooden legs cheap against the floor. Instead of at his hip, I'm now sitting just beneath his shoulder. No farther though, I tell myself, keep some distance from his face, his gaze, his indifference. Again, against the sterile white sheets, his skin looks gray. I try not to feel anything, no sadness, no anger, no love, yet I feel all three, welled up and perched in my throat. I stare at the worn wallpaper above his head, fat vertical columns, gold, then yellow, then gold, and the hush feels clumsy. I think this cannot be comforting to him, can it? But if rigid, thick silence is all a dying man wants, well, who am I not to oblige? Son, the word sounds like he put it through a colander, low and strained and difficult to bear. In response, I simply tighten my cheeks and forehead and lean in a little. He raises his bony fingers and spans them out for me to hold, I presume, but I let them hover. So he drops his hand on the bed and says, talk to me. I can feel my face slacken and the blood rush begins, pulsing hard and then harder. Below his knobby knuckles sits a heart monitor. The light is a dull, sickly red. I hope that it starts spinning or flickering or whatever. Just fill this big white space. Say something, I command myself. Fuck, say anything. And then we speak at the same time. I don't know what to, how are the, and then we wait for one another to continue. My chest feels light and my heart skittish. Like when you're about to run a race and the starter's gun is up. This is it. I'm gonna tell him, I'm gonna say, you hurt me, dad. And by God, he's gonna hear me. Please boy, you go, he says, and then exhales, heavy. His lips are stuck together in the corners. I look between my knees and study the tile a moment. It's old, but polished with random black specks. I think they look like ants. I suck in hard through my nostrils, let my mouth bunch to one side, a half smile and lift my head. His stare is iced over now and blank. And when I open my mouth, his eyes idle. And then slow as pouring oil, they close. Thank you. I have all kinds of thoughts about why that works, why it should be looked at closely. Can you speak to that? Why, why that passage? Why that piece? I think I can. Uh, I, I think, and I'm always uncomfortable uh, talking praiseworthy about my work because when I hear myself read, I think it sounds like complete excrement. But uh, <laughs> I think this works because I'm always, when I write, I try to get rid of all of the the flashes and the, the thunder in my head and the excitement of writing something new. Um, and I have to quiet myself and really say, what is it that I want this, the readers to know or feel that the character's feeling? Um, 
And for this one, I wanted to address the concept of death because I think I can safely say that we're all afraid of dying in some way. Uh, even people with the strongest faith have doubts and questions and curiosities. But I wanted to, to take it one more step and say, okay, uh, everyone's curious at least about dying, but I think what's terrifying is the thought of dying having not been able to speak your truth. Mm. Or I think it's terrifying to think about dying having been maybe misunderstood. I think that's much more terrifying than simply no longer existing in the world. Yeah. And that's Beautiful. what I tried to capture in this with a lot of the silence and the clumsiness and, and whatnot. Beautiful. Uh, I hope I hope folks will, will take a look at this. Um, one of the many things that you do so well is you, you abandon all of the um, extra that, that we might put inside of a scene um, and we're left with these really spare, intense um, intimacies. Uh, and it happens over and over again in your fiction. I've read this chat book, uh, another chat book, and um, a longer project you've been working on. And um, I'm always mowed over at the, the intense intimacy and spareness that, that comes along in these scenes. And you managed to do what you said in such... Um, a small space. That's literally the whole piece. I don't know how many words it is, but it's it's only a few hundred, and it's uh, it's really breathtaking that you can pull that off in that short a space. Um, is that uh, just one follow up question, question? I promised myself I wouldn't do follow ups, but um, is is your revision process does it, does it involve lots of cutting, um, or do you do you end up your first draft? Do they do you tend to write in short um, mini moments like this? It's an awesome question, and I really appreciate the, the kind words. You got me all inspired. I want to go write like five books. All right, five books. Um, I would say all of my editing is cutting. Mm -hmm. It's all cutting. It's all filtering. And I think I, I'd like to mention this later, too, but I'm always constantly asking my, myself, are you oversteering the readers? Are you not giving them enough credit? Uh, it's up to them to discover. And if you're talking too much, Chad, you need to shut up and get out of the way. Thank you. I wish that uh, you'd have simply said that and I could have gotten rid of my a lot of my blather in my subtext episode. But that's what my oversteering the reader. That's that's really savvy. So, Chad, uh, two two chat book uh, contests, one, um, many other really fine publications and we'll send people to your website. Um, what what now? What next? So, uh, yeah, I thought I might want to share this um, just so other people who are maybe in the same boat um, can maybe have some kind of inspiration. But I am still in the midst of this hard fought novel manuscript, John, that you're well aware of. Um, and this thing has continued to kick me in the teeth, the brain, the groin over and over and over again. Uh, it's gone through so many developmental edits, so many reshapings, reconsiderings, and doubts, and all of that stuff. Um, I even had one bad night where I thought about driving down to Lake Michigan and chucking it in the dark waters forever. Sure. But I think we've all been there. Sure. Um, however. However, on the positive, uh, I decided that it's, I believe in this book. I believe in what it's saying and I believe in its characters and, and I'm just, I need somebody else to believe in it too. And um, I don't think it's about the intricacies of, of writing. And of course that's all in there, the, the POV and the narrative arts. And I still got to deal with all of that, but um, I feel like I have maybe started to duck behind some, some boundaries that I'm making up uh, in my head. And, I become uh, complacent or, or I'm hiding in this safe place. And uh, I decided shame on me. So my current work is that I am going to see this novel manuscript through. Uh, that's my main priority. Yes, uh, in my immediate space, I've got a couple cool things going on. I'm doing this New York City midnight challenge. If anybody's ever heard of that, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I think so. Sure. Uh, it's such a great challenge out of 
New York City, um, they give you the prompt at midnight um, and they, they put you in these categories and it pushes you out of your comfort zone. So I wound up writing a story uh, in the comedy genre and then they give you like a symbol that you have to use and it's really challenging but you have 24 hours to write it and then they keep um you know layering you and you know the winners sift off and whatnot so i'm doing that right now on two levels and i'm in the round two that's been a lot of fun and then i am working on my other novel and uh, i am absolutely jubilant about this is me being jubilant i got serious <laughs> nice. uh, and you will you will uh, let us know. In fact, two reasons I'd like you to come back. And well, I, I definitely would like to have an episode in the future in which we talk about just those, all of the final fussy decision-making processes you go through once you have a manuscript and you go out into the world and you start talking with agents and other authors and other supporters. Uh, and I know you've done this and um, you have, you have a, I think, a lot to say. So I hope you'll come back for that reason. And, and also uh, come back next time and we'll talk about the, the next novel that you're working on. So, so essentially you have a novel you've completed. You're, you're still working with it, a brand new novel you're working on. Meanwhile, you're doing some, some uh, additional writing. I am. Um, can you tell us uh, a bit of advice about that? Uh, I know you have an, a compelling work schedule. Uh, so talk to writers who are perhaps in your shoes or, or in my shoes for a long time, teacher and writer doing all this stuff. Yes. And uh, yes, I would love to talk about that. I think it's really uh, important uh, because as a teacher and a father, uh, my time is, is limited. But I was thinking about this earlier today about um, how many cheerleading sessions that I've had over the decades of teaching where a kid has come to me and said, I'm done, I'm quitting, I'm thrown in the towel. Um, and I just recently learned that those exchanges have been nicknamed a Brofman lecture. And I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, but the, in essence, the, the gist of the lecture is this, that uh, with all of the stumbling box and the monkey wrenches and all of the things, the tears of frustration, all of that stuff. I tell kids and, and myself and my sons, this, this might not be about you in the end. There might be a future patient, a future customer, uh, a future stranger. You don't, you don't know who they are. They might not even be born yet, but they are waiting out there for you to become the best version of yourself. And I think as writers or artists in general, I think it's even more important. I think it's just spot on. Uh, there might be a future reader who's, who's waiting to, to hear about this character that's going through the same thing that they are so that they don't feel so alone. Uh, it might sound a little bit sentimental, but I truly do believe in that. So sometimes when I'm thinking about throwing in the towel myself, I step back and say, this isn't about me anymore. I am supposed to be awake at 4.15, tired as hell, but it, it's not about me. And if I'm being blessed enough to be tapped on the shoulder to say, hey, you need to write this story, then it, it's my obligation to do it. And that includes all of the, the crap that goes along with it, the self-doubt and the angst and even the anger and the frustration, because again, it's not about me. I concluded that as a, as a writer, I don't have the right to not write.